morning, everyone. Uh, we'll start in just a minute. We'll just give Zoom a minute for it to connect people to the webinar. Morning, everyone. We'll start in about 15 seconds. We're just going to give a few minutes for Zoom to connect everybody to the webinar. Okay, um, we'll get started. Uh, Mark Crowther, Chair of Medicine. I think everybody knows who I am. Uh, welcome to Chair's Grand Round, the second last of the uh, year. I was reflecting on Chair's Grand Rounds uh, recently and someone pointed out that we've taken a real social medicine bent, whereas traditionally they had been presenting original science. And I would say that is absolutely true. And we're continuing along in that bent today uh, on uh, another social medicine topic. Tim O'Shea, who most of us know, asked if he could present on some of the work that he's been doing uh, in Hamilton. And we're going to hear about that today. Next month's Chair's Grand Rounds will actually be back to science and a, a great presentation by Dr. O'Byrne, who we all know is our Dean. And he's going to talk about the evolution of asthma care which has been really quite revolutionary and will mark a, what I hope is a semi-permanent return for us back to um, uh, non-COVID uh, content. We've had our grand rounds dominated by COVID over the last year or so for reasons that I just can't figure out. We have two speakers today. The first is Kaylee Connolly, who obtained a social sciences degree majoring in anthropology, then moved on to a bachelor of science in nursing, both from Mac. Uh, she went on to work as a nurse in the emergency department at McMaster and continues to work uh, casually well, I don't think anybody actually works casually in the merger, are really busy when they're there at the GERV. Um, in 2010, she switched gears and worked with the Salvation Army, developing and managing the Hospital of Homes program, and more recently has been uh, with the Transitional Beds program at Good Shepherd since 2020. And uh, Tim <clears throat> probably doesn't need a lot of uh, introduction. He graduated with a Bachelor of Sciences in Biomedical Sciences from Guelph uh, before coming to Mac, and then did an MPH at Harvard. And uh, Tim has been helping uh, in many different ways with uh, Hamilton's disadvantaged populations, as I think we all know for the last couple of years, and has had uh, quite a remarkable track record of uh, success, both clinically, but also in terms of getting funding for uh, research and other projects uh, with these populations. So with that, I will turn it over to Tim uh, and Kaylee, and I will mute myself and turn off my camera. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Nice to be here this morning. Thank you for having us here today. Um, as Mark mentioned in the introduction, there will be very little science in this presentation and a lot of uh, social medicine. So hopefully, um, hopefully folks are ready for that. So um, this, this rounds came out of um, a conversation that Kaylee and I had probably about six or eight months ago um, and a conversation that we come back to again and again. Um, as Mark mentioned again in the introduction, Kaylee runs the discharge beds and the transitional beds program at the Good Shepherd. Um, and in that role sees people coming through both that program as well as people coming through the shelter system um, at, when they leave hospital. Uh, and sometimes that goes well and probably more often it doesn't. And so um, we've had conversations uh, more than a dozen times or so about some of the things that seem like they might be low hanging fruit in terms of improving that process. Um, and out of one of those conversations, we emailed Mark and asked him if we could come and present this here today. And so, um, and so here we are. Um, so jumping into the presentation, if I can figure out Zoom, nothing to disclose in terms of uh, financial disclosures. So basically the, the plan for today uh, really is to focus on the last point here on the objectives, which is to talk about a couple of programs that we want people uh, to be aware of in the hospital that can help with some of the barriers that people face to um, accessing good care when they do leave the hospital. Um, and so we're going to spend the bulk of the time talking about that. In order to get there, uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of things just in terms of uh, some of the structure of homelessness in Hamilton, uh, a little bit about the shelter system itself and, and what is available within the shelter system. So, uh, so, so as to frame things for for all of us when we're writing discharge um, orders or coming up with plans for people. Um, and if those plans include somebody going to a shelter, I think it's important for us to realize what that actually means practically for that individual um, so that we can, we can start to think of ways to improve success of, of those discharges. So starting with just the definition, um, so the uh, homelessness uh, definition, um, the Canadian definition from the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness 
reads as follows, homelessness describes the situation of an individual, family, or community without stable, safe, permanent, appropriate housing, or the immediate prospect means and ability of acquiring it. Um, so a couple of words really to highlight in there is, is the features of, of housing uh, that are important um, to make somebody housed. So uh, things have to, again, be stable, meaning that they're not, uh, it's not something that they might lose in a week or lose in a, in a month. It has to be safe, and obviously that en encompasses a lot of different things. Um, it's not a, a, a temporary arrangement. And then again, appropriate, meaning that it's, uh, it, it fits the needs of the individual um, or the family that it is serving. Um, some background stats. So um, enumerating the homeless population in, in Canada or in any population is really quite a difficult thing to do. And so most of the numbers that we see are um, estimates. Most of them come from um, the point in time counts that were happening again prior to the pandemic, haven't happened in Hamilton since, uh, where people will go out and kind of survey um, uh, communities for to, to find out how many people are um, in the situations that are described. Um, homelessness is kind of, uh, not kind of, homelessness is oftentimes invisible. So uh, people that are homeless often don't interact with, that, with the system or um, come into contact with places where they might be counted. And so a lot of this ends up being kind of um, invisible or swept away. Um, having said that, the most recent estimates that we have say that about 235,000 individuals in Canada are homeless in any given year. So that's not necessarily on every given day, but uh, that number of people will experience homelessness during a year. And about 20% of those are chronically homeless, meaning that they're, they, they spend three consecutive months uh, in a situation of homelessness. Um, we subcategorize homelessness into several different categories that they're listed here. It includes people who are unsheltered. So those are people who are sleeping rough or sleeping on the streets or staying in places that aren't meant for human habitation. Uh, we then have people that are residing in emergency shelters. And I think this is kind of the picture that we often think of when we think of homelessness, the people that are in our um, shelter systems um, in, in whatever city we reside in. Um, but it also includes people who are precariously or provisionally accommodated, uh, people who are couch surfing or staying in places that, that are not stable and that, they, and that are, they're at risk of losing. I, I decided not to spend a lot of slides going through all the different studies that have documented the fact that people who are homeless are sicker than people who are housed. I think it's uh, intuitive. Um, it's also been shown in many different studies in many different areas um, over and over again. And again, it doesn't really, I think, uh, uh, need us to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, but just again, to summarize, we know that people who are homeless uh, become sick more frequently. When they do become sick, they suffer worse outcomes for given disease states compared to age match controls who are, uh, who have this, who are housed. Um, and their illnesses last for longer. We know that there's a higher proportion of both psychiatric illnesses and substance use disorders in the homeless population. And this is a very complex um, uh, uh, arrangement, if you will, where people who have psychiatric illnesses and substance use disorders are more likely to become homeless and homelessness then exacerbates these conditions as well. Um, and the most recent um, uh, estimation of life expectancy for chronically homeless individuals that I was able to find is 39 years. So uh, extremely reduced life expectancy um, for that population. So the Hamilton Emergency Shelter System is set up uh, to provide um, a bit of a release valve or again, an emergency uh, net for people who are experiencing homelessness. And currently in our city, we have uh, four emergency men's shelters operating, three emergency women's shelters, uh, as well as one uh, overflow program that, was, that is meant to be temporary, but has been operating continuously since the winter of 2019. Um, uh, we have two shelters for women and children who are experiencing abuse or violence. We have one shelter for youth and one shelter for families. Um, COVID and the COVID epidemic has changed the shelter system in Hamilton in a couple of different ways. Uh, first off, um, because of spacing within the shelters, the existing shelter uh, capacity was reduced so that, more, so that more space could be provided within the shelters for safety purposes. And then the city also um, expanded shelter capacity by opening overflow hotel spaces as well as during uh, last summer um, uh, and fall, uh, we had the first Ontario Centre as well opened up to, to help to expand the shelter space. Current capacity sits at about 350 beds. 
Um, in, terms of, in terms of trying to find space for people in shelters, the women's sector has been at or over capacity consistently since 2018. And that's reflected in the fact that our overflow, uh, temporary overflow shelter continues to operate on a nightly basis. And so it's often extremely difficult to find space for women in particular in shelter. Uh, men's sector oc occupancy fluctuates depending on lots of different circumstances. Uh, we've seen those numbers go up and down through the COVID epidemic in particular as people uh, rightly start to fear the risk of COVID within shelters and sometimes find alternate accommodation. Um, and spaces for couples are, are, are often difficult to find as well. So people often have to split up and go into the individual men's or women's shelters in that situation. Um, Hamilton shelter system in COVID. So as I mentioned, there's been an expansion into some hotels. So we currently have the Admiral Inn operating as a women's uh, shelter run by the Good Shepherd. We have the Four Points uh, Hotel in Stony Creek operated by Mission Services. Uh, that's an overflow shelter for men and for couples. Um, the First Ontario Centre, as I mentioned, was operating last year as an overflow shelter for men. There's also been at the opening of some um, isolation spaces. So we have an a city run isolation space for homeless individuals um, at the Bonetto Recreation Center in the north end of Hamilton, and as well a isolation space run by Wesley uh, Urban Ministries at, at one of their locations downtown. Uh, COVID also brought to the forefront the issue of, um, of people sleeping rough or sleeping outside in encampments. Uh, this was obviously a very charged issue last year when there was very large encampments outside of the Wesley Day Centre on Ferguson Street, as well as outside of First Ontario Place. Um, again, just to sort of highlight that we've always had people sleeping outside, we've always had encampments, particularly in the summer months, but really year round, we have people sleeping outside in Hamilton. It's not uncommon, it's not a new COVID thing, uh, but COVID really did make it much more visible uh, due to the existence of these very large encampments that happened last year. And we anticipate that a similar um, situation will likely arise as the weather warms up this year, as people start to to uh, to choose um, choose is a, a difficult word, but um, to to find outside accommodation um, due to again a number of different factors that we won't get into here today. So again, when, when somebody's leaving the hospital uh, from your care and going to a shelter, again, just to sort of frame what it looks like when they get there. Um, this is a picture of one of our, uh, our men's shelter dorms. So uh, in general, people are sleeping uh, either in dorms or in some shelters in, in their own rooms, uh, particularly in the women's sector. Um, in the men's sector, mostly we have dorm spaces. Uh, Pre-COVID, there was bunk beds in many of the dorms that has, that has been taken away due to COVID and, and concerns over people sleeping so close together. And so there has been an increase in space in the areas. Um, Important to note that it, when you're discharging somebody from hospital, if, if they require bed rest, if they require access to their bed during the day, a physician's note is required. Um, otherwise, the dorms are clean during the day and people are asked to leave between the hours of um, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, so again, just an important consideration. Uh, again, if people are leaving the hospital unwell and sick, um, it's often important to make sure that they're able to uh, have a place to rest during the day. We do have a medical support system set up within the uh, shelters in Hamilton. We're lucky in Hamilton to have the shelter health network that's been in existence since 2007 and operates clinics in the shelter space itself. Um, so this is a partnership between the physician group, which is the shelter health network, as well as the um, service providers, the uh, uh, shelter providers who provide the space and, and as well some logistical support. Um, shelter health network is made up mostly of primary care physicians as well as nurse practitioners. Uh, and clinics run generally once or twice a week in, in the different shelter locations. These are mostly drop-ins so people can, can show up uh, with whatever medical concern they have and can get seen and assessed by a um, medical professional in that setting. And so this is an option for discharge follow-up, um, again, that I think is important for us to keep, to, to keep in mind and to consider. Outside those clinic hours, any medical issues that arise are attended to by the shelter staff. And again, the shelter staff have first aid training, but aren't medical professionals, um, and then um, access an EMS if required. Um, shelter staff can help clients uh, getting to appointments, um, getting the medications, doing all the follow-up that needs to be done, but this re relies on the patients or the clients telling the shelter staff about this and disclosing it to them. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, part of the 
the handover when people go into the shelter system. Um, important to note as well that there are restrictions from shelters for a number of different reasons. So often, oftentimes uh, clients can be restricted. Uh, some of the reasons include violent behavior, verbal abuse, possession of drugs or drug paraphernalia. Um, and these uh, can result in restrictions from the shelter system that last either for a day up to a month or sometimes even longer. Um, and again, just in terms of uh, thinking about discharging patients from the hospital, uh, important to remember that although a shelter bed may be secured on discharge, that might change uh, in short order depending on, on the situation in that shelter. Uh, medications in the shelter. So again, just when we're writing prescriptions and people are going off to the shelter system, um, just keeping in mind the resources that are available uh, to manage these things within a shelter setting. Uh, patient medications are, are stored um, in bins behind the front desk at the shelter. Prescriptions must be handed in to the staff when people enter the shelter system. And then it's up to the, to the client again to go and ask for their medications from staff um, uh, during the day when they need them. So it's, it's, it relies on the patient um, remembering and, and thinking about it uh, amongst all the other competing priorities that they are facing. Uh, and also just in, it adds that one extra barrier of the fact that they don't have the medications in their possession, they have to go and uh, retrieve them from the staff. So uh, that's a bit of just, again, a, a overview of where things sit in the shelters and from a medical management point of view. Um, and then Kaylee and I thought we'd just run through a quick case um, that illustrates some of the barriers that people face when they leave the hospital. So I'll run through this quickly and then I'm gonna hand it over to Kaylee to talk about the transitional beds program. Uh, this is a gentleman that, um, that was admitted to hospital uh, late last year. Uh, he had a history of opioid use disorder and stimulant use, use disorder, had been chronically homeless, um, hadn't been stably housed in the last two years and had been over those two years um, cycling between, uh, again, a, a very common story, um, either using emergency shelters, um, finding places to stay with friends, um, or sleeping outside. He'd been in and out of hospitals multiple times in the previous three years for a number of different reasons, um, and his last uh, uh, opioid replacement therapy was one year ago. He came into hospital extremely unwell, um, admitted uh, from the emergency room um, uh, straight to the CCU with uh, congestive heart failure and shock, um, required intubation and blood pressure support uh, radon admission. And so uh, there was some difficulty in terms of getting history and background. Uh, he wasn't able to give any history or background. Uh, and the, there wasn't, uh, despite efforts, we weren't able to find any family or friends that could kind of fill in some of the details. Um, he was found to have endocarditis of his tricuspid valve and MRSA bacteremia. Um, and because of uh, the severity of his illness, he ended up with some necrotic wounds on his feet bilaterally and up to his mid shin. So initially in the CCU, he was uh, started on all the right medications. He was uh, given all the right sort of fluid support and blood pressure support and cardiovascular surgery was consulted. Um, and initially on the first consult, uh, the conclusion was that the surgery would have been too high risk. And although it was conceded that he was likely to die without the surgery, um, uh, at that point in time, um, consideration was given to palliation and comfort measures. Um, eventually, a second opinion from cardiovascular surgery was sought, and uh, um, the patient was eventually brought to the OR and had his tricuspid valve repaired. And he did quite well, really, afterwards. He had a prolonged stay in the ICU and then up to the ward to convalesce, um, but eventually did recover um, and was deemed to be ready for discharge. So at that point, when he was ready to kind of walk out the door and, and you know, that we're getting phone calls about, um, you know, he's ready to go, what's the plan in terms of getting him out? There was a number of issues I think that needed to be considered. Um, and I've listed some of them here. Uh, at, at the top again was the fact that he did have an ongoing um, infection that required IV antibiotics by a pick line. And that was going to require either the Lynn home care services coming into his place of residence, wherever that was going to be, or him going to an infusion clinic multiple times a day. He had other uh, oral medications as well that he was required to take that, that needed close follow-up and that really it was important to ensure he, he adhered to. Um, and then there was multiple follow-up appointments booked for him uh, that, he was, that he was to attend in the coming weeks and months. He also had an active substance use disorder that he was prescribed a daily dispense medication. So that would mean a daily trip to the pharmacy to pick those up. Um, he had follow-up planned with his addiction medicine physician as well. 
And then just in terms of considerations, thinking about uh, going into a shelter setting and the, and the potential for destabilizing the substance use disorder, which at that point was actually doing quite well um, um, from his medical management point of view. And then finally, he had chronic wounds to his feet that required daily wound care and again would require the Lynn home care services to be able to access him on a daily basis. And as well, thinking about the importance of him keeping those wounds dressed and clean in whatever setting he was to go to. So if you sort of think about that complex medical situation and, and then going to a situation where um, you're in a, in a dorm setting in a shelter where medications are kept at the desk, um, uh, where you're again outside for much of the day if, if you're not uh, written bed rest, um, or even thinking about being in a, in a tent where we've seen patients in similar situations end up um, upon discharge you can start to imagine why many times these types of discharges do fail. And just kind of thinking around some of the things that the, uh, this patient and other patients are facing, um, again, um, thinking about all of the different things that need to be managed by the patient themselves, the medications that need to be taken, the appointments that they have to get to, um, care for, for their wounds and other things that need to be done, uh, the competing priorities that might interfere with them uh, paying as much attention to their health as is required for recovery um, and all things again that if you sort of put yourself in, in that patient's shoes you can imagine interfering with your ability to do it as well. Um, and then the fact that when things go wrong when when plans fall apart oftentimes our patients have had traumatic experiences in the hospital that prevent them from seeking care uh, when things do go wrong until things kind of get very far advanced um, and, and sometimes we're wondering why people don't come back earlier. Um, so then trying to think about how to improve transitions from hospital to shelter, uh, looking through some of the literature, one of the things that I came across that I thought really summarized things well was an, uh, um, a synthesis of experience from um, the UK in a, in a program that's called the uh, Intermediate Care uh, Program, which looks to do exactly what I'm talking about here, smooth transitions from hospital to shelter. And just some of the best practices that they described that I think you'll see in, in the two programs that are, are going to be described in the, in the ensuing slides. Um, some of the best practices they recommended were, um, and the first one again, which I think they intentionally put first, was that the place of care and timing of transition are decided in consultation with the service user. So the patient gets input and gets to sign off on the discharge plan um, as an important first step. Um, they also underline the fact that engagement is an important part of any transition, meaning that uh, we have to recognize that sometimes um, our patients aren't going to trust us right off the bat. They're not going to um, uh, buy into our plans right off the bat. And that this has to be an ongoing relationship that doesn't last for a week or two in the hospital or a week or two upon discharge at the shelter, uh, but is a longitudinal uh, relationship with the same providers in order to build up that trust. They also highlight that tackling discrimination and stigma must, must be a central component to any discharge plan. Um, so recognizing that our patients again often face discrimination in the hospital uh, and oftentimes there's some intersecting discrimination as well. Um, any transitional care program has to take that into account and actually actively take that on. Um, and I, I appreciated the one quote under this best practice which was compassionate, kindness, dignity and respect are values which sit at the heart of many transition programs. Um, discharge to housing that has the proper supports is preferred over discharge to shelter. That seems again intuitive. Important to think about safe spaces for women and how all of the programs that we develop um, meet the needs of, of women in the women's sector. And that advocacy and uh, advocating for system and policy change is an important part of the transition program as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee, who's going to talk about the transitional beds program, which again, um, uh, we wanted to highlight today as an example of a program that's taking on some of these issues and is, is uh, actively making a difference in them. So over to Kaylee. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. Um, as uh, Tim said, my name is Kaylee and I'm the nurse manager of the Transitional Beds Program with the Good Shepherd. And with my background being very strongly rooted in hospital, um, in the emergency room, I had the um, ability to see a lot of patients come through um, almost in a cyclical manner where we weren't really seeing the positive patient outcomes that we had um, hoped for. And it got me thinking of what is it that what factors were we missing or what things were we not 
um, understanding and then trying to come up with a different way to approach things so that perhaps we could achieve a more um, uh, more positive patient health outcome. So the transitional beds program is an attempt to answer some of those questions. Now, sorry, Tim, how do I do my screen here? There we go. So again, the transitional beds program um, is a Lynn funded program and we are located on the third floor of the uh, Good Shepherd Emergency Men's Shelter in downtown Hamilton. We are a 10 bed, um, we have a 10 bed uh, capacity and we provide short term non hospital based care for patients facing homelessness. Now I say non hospital based because a lot of the services that we can support are similar to some that you can get in hospital, but as we identified earlier, a lot of individuals that I engage with have identified hospital visits and hospital stays as a sometimes negative experience and almost traumatic in some ways. So providing an alternate environment for them to receive care um, is important in the engagement piece. Um, we work within a harm reduction framework. So again, not requiring um, an individual to abstain from substance use. We provide education around safe usage as well as provide clients with harm reduction supplies when asked. So just to, to broaden on what Tim just spoke about, um, the patient becomes the center, the center of goal setting, the center of care planning. I think oftentimes as health practitioners, we may see a trajectory with a goal in mind. And oftentimes a patient may not have the same idea or the same goal in mind because of the competing priorities in their life. So when people are coming to the transitional beds program, they become the center of all conversation, the center of, as Tim said, signing off on all plans. Um, this, I think, is very important in building a therapeutic relationship with clients and slowly over the course of time building trust. Referrals to the program are generated from hospitals, and that includes emergency departments as well as um, hospital wards. And not surprisingly, most of the referrals that we do see are generated from social workers, but again, anyone is, is free to refer. So with regards to our goal, length of stay, so our goal is approximately six weeks. And again, that number was uh, came to because of the length of stay or the length of somebody would receive generally an IV course of antibiotics. Now, again, keeping in mind, everybody is different. Every situation is different. That length of stay can be less, um, can be significantly less, or can be more depending on the situation that we are um, facing. The staffing model at the program supports 24 hour a day care, um, that's 365 days a year. Um, it has RN support, an RPN and a PSW. So at any given time, there is always an RPN and a PSW on site to support clients. We also have a case manager who is dedicated to the program and her role is really to collaborate and work with clients to transition them and work with them from point of admission to us in achieving appropriate housing and again safe obviously you know trying to be permanent um, at the time of discharge so she also her role is also to kind of pull in all of the other services whether that be trusteeship whether that be previous um, case management other programs so instead of a siloed approach we try to bring that all together to um, create a team and a support system around each patient so all medications and this is very similar to what you would see in a hospital ward all medications are transcribed and documented onto a medication administration record and are stored in a medication cart um, in a nursing station so all um, medications are dispensed and administered by my program staff and 
again, this eliminates a lot of the back and forth to pharmacy for daily dispensing. As you can imagine, when you're not feeling well and you're recovering, um, having to travel sometimes a pretty far distance to get um, your medications on a daily basis, sometimes twice a day, is uh, quite overwhelming. So physician support for the program is again provided through the Shelter Health Network. And we have a wonderful group of four physicians and they take on a week of call at, at a time. And during that week, they will physically come into the program um, twice a week for rounds. And during that time, it allows patients to approach the physicians and meet with them to discuss any concerns that they have about their care plan, have medication renewals, and any sort of follow up on any sort of um, consultations, appointments, or blood work that has you know, preceded the week before. And outside of those times, these physicians are on call for us 24 hours a day um, in case of emergencies. Um, in addition to the physician support, and I will say primarily with backgrounds in um, primary medicine, um, we also have access to an addictions uh, specialist as well as an infectious disease specialist. And like we had outlined in the case study, oftentimes there are patients that we had that have a lot of compounding um, conditions and having access to somebody for consultation has been very, very helpful. Um, patients presenting with no family doctor upon admission to the program, which is uh, quite common, um, we try our best to connect them with one to ensure continued care upon discharge. Now, that being said, again, patients being placed at the center um, of all conversations, a lot of input that I've received from individuals that we have engaged with have identified negative interactions uh, associated with previous um, family physicians or healthcare practitioners. And this is sometimes an, an evolution. And obviously, not introducing somebody to a family doctor right up until their discharge isn't going to be a you know fostering a positive relationship so this is worked on throughout the entire admission so on site we have capabilities for blood work and this includes iv initiation and management um, ecgs uh, whether or not we're um, using that um, to titrate any methadone. Um, this has been very, very handy again because it decreases the patient's need to travel to multiple locations to get the same service. So instead of going to one lab to get an ECG, another lab the next day to get blood work um, and having knowing that they have negative interactions sometimes, um, that this has, has been met with a lot of enthusiasm from patients. So the program itself has an accessible washroom, as well as a shower with a shower chair that, that it can accommodate a shower chair. The building itself is equipped both with a ramp on the exterior of the building, as well as an elevator inside. So we are able to accommodate patients requiring the use of larger mobility aids, such as wheelchairs, power chairs, and um, scooters. Um, we have widened the uh, washroom door to accommodate a bariatric wheelchair, which we um, had an issue with in the beginning. Um, since opening the program, just as some examples, we've seen patients admitted for anything from opioid use disorder, recurrent cellulitis, endocarditis, COPD exacerbation, uncontrolled diabetes, uh, antibiotic administration by a PICC line, and post-op recovery from a multitude of um, interventions. So when we're speaking about eligibility criteria, they must be over 18 years of age. Um, we, they must be precariously housed or facing homelessness. And I wanted to also include um, that it's not a, a black or white issue here, that it would include patients that are currently housed but can't safely return due to a medical condition or any sort of restrictions. So, you know, you have an individual who has a fracture and is non weight bearing and maybe lives in a rooming house that is on the second floor and is unable to return to that environment because the environment itself isn't um, set up. So they may come for a short stay to receive PTOT to strengthen themselves to allow um, for a little bit of extra time so that Lynn services could go into that home and require any and, and implement any sort of modifications to the environment so that we can make sure that they can return safely. 
And it also would include people, you know, any individual who's facing any sort of circumstances that would limit their ability to access services. And again, when you see um, individuals who are sleeping rough, LIN services can't be initiated. That relationship can't be started without an address. So having somebody having to go to a clinic every single day or twice a day to either get blood work or have an appointment or to have an infusion while they're sleeping in a tent, they won't have that wraparound service. They also need to require a stabilization or medical um, stabilization of one or more compounding conditions, acute or chronic in it. And this often, um, they're individuals don't normally when they present to us as a referral have just one issue um, so we would take the six six weeks in which to stabilize one or more of these issues so exclusion criteria this is this was a tough one for me because um, I didn't really what in in creating this um, I didn't really come up with any exclusion criteria and that was for a reason. I feel as though there are a lot of programs um, that exist um, and many of them have very tight inclusion and exclusion criteria. And what happens is that you're inevitably going to have patients that fall through that and don't fit in any specific um, program at one at one point in time. So all referred patients are considered on a case by case basis. And if we're able to help, then we will. Um, that said, the only limiting factor that we do have is because we do operate out of an emergency shelter environment, we do not have the ability to accommodate patients that require the use of lifts or full care. Um, our setup is a dorm style setup where we would have two to three patients in one dorm room. So it doesn't provide the privacy that um, full care would require. We can't have an individual that requires the use of a commode or any sort of bedside care. So this brings me to the referral process. So we all know that planned discharges, well-planned discharges start on admission. So general, generally, I would like all referrals to be generated as soon as possible. So if you see any sort of um, no fixed address or any sort of compounding issues, whether it be um, psychiatric illnesses or substance use disorders, generate this as, as quickly as you can. The program since opening has run on a wait list. Um, at most of the time, anywhere from four to five patients. And at the height um, with COVID um, earlier on, we had a wait list as a, of as many as 16 patients at one time. So referral forms are available on the Good Shepherd website. Um, you will notice when you find us that there are two refer referral forms that need to be filled out. One of them is a physician to physician referral form, and that is outlining any sort of follow-up, any sort of blood work diagnostics that would need to be followed up on by our physician team during their admission with us. And the other is a more general referral form. And this would include um, information about health history, social history, any sort of um, addictions history, any other practitioners that are involved, um, income information. And um, once those are completed, those would need to be faxed to the unit and myself as the program manager would then reach out to the referral source to ask any further information to discuss any concerns or anything that popped out um, at me with regards to discharge planning and to outline bed availability and the, the current wait list. Once that relationship is um, formed and once the patient is accepted, I come into the hospital to visit the patient where they're at. I meet with the healthcare team to address, again, any concerns or any sort of issues we might have about discharge planning. And then I also have a face-to-face -face with the clients so that I can introduce the program, tell them what it is that they can expect from us and to answer any questions. And oftentimes from point of referral to when the patient comes, this can be anywhere from a week uh, you know, days to a week. And during that time, this is an opportunity for the transition to go 
mo most as smoothly as we can. And I find that meeting clients and meeting patients in hospital and providing that face to the um, to the program has uh, resulted in them feeling a little bit more comfortable in the process. So a little bit about us. Um, since we opened in March of 2020, we've served 67 unique um, individuals. 65 of those have been men and two of them have been women. Uh, the average age of patients admitted has been 47.4 uh, years old. And we have a quite, at any given time with the 10 individuals, we do see individuals as young as 23 and as old as, as 80. Uh, the average length of stay has been 87 days, and you'll notice that's obviously a discrepancy from our goal. And over the last year, I, everybody has been challenged, and having a limited community services still operating in the same capacity has uh, resulted in that increased length of stay. Um, with regards to discharge dispositions, um, of the 67 individuals, um, 10 of which are still residing, um, three have, are deceased, 24 have been transitioned to independent housing situations, five to supportive housing, two to retirement homes, three remanded into custody and lost to follow-up, and 20 of those have been unplanned patient-initiated uh, discharges who have also been uh, lost to follow up. And in those situations, oftentimes I'll see them cycle through the system again, and we have an opportunity to re-engage at that point. So thank you all very much. I'm going to hand it over to Tim again. I'm back. Thank you, Kaylee. Kaylee will be here obviously for questions at the end as well. I'm just gonna quickly run through another program that's not specifically designed to serve patients that are homeless, but oftentimes uh, due to the nature of the program does. And so again, just something to be made aware of in terms of things that we can access from the inpatient side. This is called the Second Heart Program. Um, this is a program that is being done as a research uh, study. And the uh, PI on the study is Dr. Robin Lennox from the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster. Co-investigators are, are listed there as well from uh, the Department of Medicine, uh, Cardiovascular Surgery, Cardiology, um, and, and, and it's been funded, as mentioned on the slide, through a HASO Innovation Grant. Um, so this is a program that's aimed at people who inject drugs who are in hospital with infective endocarditis. And the rationale for the program, again, is outlined um, in the next couple of slides. Uh, this program came out of a recognition that people who inject drugs with endocarditis do similarly in the initial period of time when they're treated for their endocarditis in hospital. Uh, but then as time goes on, um, the, the outcomes become worse over time. And the mortality rates are listed here up to a 10 year mortality rate of 56%, which is quite um, jarring. The other side of this is that we, we recognize that most of the complications uh, that people run into who um, are in this situation are not necessarily due to their infection and the consequences of that but are more often due to the, um, to the, to related to the ongoing um, issue of their um, substance use disorder. Uh, and despite this, in most cases, although we've, we've made a dent in this with our inpatient addiction service in Hamilton, but in most settings, people who inject drugs with endocarditis are not offered treatment for their underlying substance use disorder while in hospital. And then adding to that complexity is some of the stuff we've talked about already, um, recognizing that individuals in this situation often come from um, a place where they uh, aren't attached to primary care, where they're living uh, in, in poverty and where they're experiencing homelessness. So the Second Heart team um, is, aims to address some of these issues by connecting people who inject drugs with endocarditis in hospital to a team that consists of a peer support worker, a systems navigator, a family physician and addiction medicine physician if desired. Uh, the goal of the program is to provide this multidisciplinary care to, to people for a year after their um, initial diagnosis with endocarditis and to try to smooth the transition back to the community um, and to ensure better outcomes. So the team again is, it consists of a number of different individuals. Uh, first off is the peer support worker. This is a trained professional who has lived experience of drug use um, and their role on the team is to ensure that uh, people are supported in attending appointments that they're supported just in the journey that they're on in terms of their illness, as well as their substance use disorder, um, that they know about 
best practices in terms of harm reduction, as well as the services that are available for them to access. And they'll contact the patient in the hospital initially and then follow them once a week for the first month and then every two weeks thereafter or more frequently if the uh, patient requests it. There's also a systems navigator that's a registered social worker. They're there to make sure that all of the things that need to be done in terms of um, uh, supporting the person uh, are done. So that might include making sure that they're on OW or ODSP if they qualify, uh, that they have access to housing workers and housing um, as quickly as possible. If they need an ID to be able to access services, either going to the pharmacy or going to appointments and follow-ups and that gets taken care of. Um, and making sure that people know when their appointments are, when their follow-up blood work is, all of, the, all of the types of things that uh, can sometimes be very difficult to keep track of. Um, if patients don't have a family physician at the time that they are enrolled in the program, then they are attached to one uh, before leaving the hospital. And, and this is organized according to the patient's needs and preferences. Um, and that family doctor will follow up with the individual within two weeks of discharge. And then finally, the addiction medicine physician is there again, if requested by the patient. So um, if, they, if they desire treatment for their substance use disorder, they'll be seen by our inpatient team in the hospital and then followed by an addiction medicine physician after leaving the hospital. Um, and this is an ongoing relationship as well. Um, a, a part of this program, which has been thus far very helpful from my perspective, is that before discharge, every patient will have a case conference that brings together the inpatient teams that are involved in the patient's care, as well as the social work and other supportive um, allied health individuals involved in their care in the hospital with the second heart team to ensure a bit of a, a warm handover from hospital to community, and as well to uh, um, ask questions that might uh, identify areas where the discharge plan might not have uh, thought of some of the barriers that are going to come up. And so this happens prior to prior to discharge of every patient. The patient is invited to attend as well, um, uh, but this helps to kind of smooth that process out. Inclusion criteria are basically somebody that's over the age of 18, able, able to uh, provide consent, and are in a Hamilton hospital with the diagnosis of infective endocarditis with a history of injection drug use within the last three months. Participants are remunerated for their participation in the study, um, and they also receive a cell phone uh, in order to maintain connection with the team throughout the study period. I put up how to refer, um, but you can find this as well in some of the posters around the hospital, um, and, and definitely something to make use of uh, if you do have patients that fall into this situation. So just back to our case before we finish, um, just, and, and just to highlight that although our patient was enrolled in both the second heart program since he was admitted with endocarditis and discharged to the transitional beds program, um, even with the, the excellent supports provided by both of these programs, things did not go according to plan. And again, I think this is just to highlight some of the things that can happen. This is not an unusual story. Uh, some of the things that can go wrong with the plan um, so this, this patient, again, was discharged to the transitional beds program, did well initially, but unfortunately uh, uh, was diagnosed as COVID positive as part of an outbreak in the program. Um, initially transferred to hospital as the city run isolation center felt that they wouldn't be able to manage his, his medical care. He stayed in hospital for a total of a day uh, after an interaction with hospital security that didn't go well. Um, uh, since he had nowhere else to go, he was then transferred to the isolation center. A big issue there was that the Lynn Home Care Services felt uncomfortable coming into the isolation center. And so his wounds went untreated uh, initially uh, until Kaylee stepped in to fill that role, which uh, didn't fall under her, um, her purview, but she, she ended up having to go to the isolation center to provide his wound care. In isolation, he ended up back in emergency room after there was an altercation there that resulted in a fracture of his frontal bone. Um, and uh, when his COVID isolation period ended, the transition beds program was still an outbreak and so he was transferred to the overflow shelter. Again, there was issues in terms of getting wound care to go out there to, to provide his wound care. And eventually he was brought back to the transition beds program to convalesce. Uh, despite all of this, uh, all of these barriers, all of these obstacles, he's, been, he's managed to attend his follow-up investigations and his visits with the multiple team members involved in his care. He's doing relatively well with respect to his wounds now that he's back at the transition beds program. He's engaged in substance use disorder treatment, and he continues to be engaged with the second heart team. 
So just a couple of take home points before we uh, go to questions. Um, I think that the, the main take home point is that I think we often do underestimate the barriers that are faced by our patients that are homeless when they're discharged from hospital. I think oftentimes we're guilty of um, coming up with a discharge plan that might work for somebody who has uh, uh, the, the resources that we all have, um, but that we don't think about all of the things again that can go wrong, all of the barriers that people face in following through with those plans. And then oftentimes we're surprised when they come back to the emergency room um, with similar problems or with a similar issue. So I think just being cognizant of what is available to people when they leave the hospital and enter the shelter system is an important thing for us to always remember uh, in terms of discharging patients. Um, I think as well, we need to start to think about engaging uh, some of the social support services that are available to patients. One of the, one of the big ones um, that, I, uh, that I involve, sorry, I've jumped at three, is the Social Navigator Paramedic Program. This is a great program run uh, out of the Hamilton Police Service that has a police officer, paramedic, and social worker uh, that help people, again, get to appointments, follow up, and make sure people are, are, are going where they need to go. Um, and then the second point, sorry, on the slide, jumping back to that one, is making sure that we're actually having open communication with the place that the patient is going to. And I think this does step out of the allied health uh, responsibility and into the physician responsibility of reaching out to those providers, saying this is the plan, is this going to work, before somebody goes there to make sure that they're not going to bounce right back again. Um, assume something is going to go wrong. So again, looking at uh, the case of our patient, it, um, again, not an unusual situation. And I think that more often than not, our plan is sounds good as people are leaving the door and then almost always something goes wrong. Um, a shelter restriction happens, a prescription is lost, some other competing priority comes up um, that gets in the way of following through. And then, and then what? So have a plan for what that patient is going to do when something does go wrong and who they're going to reach out to and where they're going to find care. Uh, think about where our responsibility begins and ends. So again, I think oftentimes we're accused of, and I think maybe it sticks a little bit, uh, look, providing excellent, spectacular care to patients when they walk through the door um, and until they walk out of the door, but then waiting for that person to come back again before that spectacular care gets extended again. Um, and thinking about extending that uh, care and concern outside of the hospital walls as well. And then again, just underlying the fact that all of this um, is due to the fact that there is homelessness in our community. Again, emergency shelters are there as an emergency backup and not as a housing solution. Um, and so we need to work with policy, uh, um, with people who are making policy to ensure that homelessness is decreased and, and stable housing is provided. I'm gonna stop there with a couple of minutes left and I'll hand it back to Mark for questions. Great. Thanks very much, both. That was really outstanding and probably something that many of us has never heard about before. So it's always good to have something completely new. Um, although we do work in the hospital, so we should all be familiar with it. There's two, a bunch of questions here. Um, and again, if people want have questions, please enter them in the question and answer box. There's two related questions, so I'll ask them both. And I'll ask Kaylee to respond to this, this one first. Um, if you could wave your magic wand and eliminate one problem that occurs repetitively at hospital discharge, what, what would it be and how would we fix it? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, again, just touching on what um, I opened with and what Tim was just speaking to is that there are so many competing priorities and not and, and not understanding and not trying or I mean, I think that we all have the best intentions. They come in with, you know, an issue we treat and we discharge and then we're sometimes surprised when they come back with the same issue and not having not seeing a, a great outcome and i think that perhaps taking the time and asking you know you know p passing the prescription and asking is there anything that would would you know help you to um, or is there anything present that you would be that would impede you or would impede your ability to get this done? And if we're discharging you to a shelter, I can fax this to a shelter, I can call them, and I can make sure that you get the care and, and the medication that you need. So I, I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's just, um, again, going back to that last slide is understanding all of the barriers and all of the competing priorities that might take somebody's focus off of their health. And, you know, the, a lot of feedback that I get from um, individuals that I've engaged with is that oftentimes the negative interactions that they may have with health practitioners is 
as a result, if there is a substance use um, disorder, that the impression is that they don't know how to make decisions that are best for them. And keeping the patient at the center of all the conversations and ask, asking more questions and asking more about their experience, um, I think would be a great start. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, Tim, uh, Tim, I'll ask you, Greg Kernow asked a related question is that, that people just don't know what resources are available in a general sense. It sounds like Kaylee's program has a very good website, but it would be, Tim's suggesting it would be useful to put together a, 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 sim, a, a single website that links all the resources that would be available to physicians at the time of discharge. Thoughts on that? Sure, why not? We can house it in the Department of Medicine and, and get it up and running. I mean, I think, again, a lot of times the social workers on the wards know about this stuff, is uh, know about a lot of it, but not all of it for sure. And new programs pop up and go away and come and go. So I think having something that was central and, and maintained would, would make a lot of sense. Yeah, so maybe you and I should have a conversation about that. We're in the throes of redesigning our website. Just sure. Uh, for Kaylee, um, of, of the people who've gone through your program, only two were women. Uh, is there a reason why the ratio is so low and do we need to do more to support women who are in these situations? Um, so we have had two women, yes. And again, being housed in a men's emergency men's shelter, um, oftentimes not having the space um, to adequately dedicate if we're coming at it from a trauma-informed um, approach. Oftentimes, uh, the women don't feel comfortable in that environment, and that's completely understandable. And it's definitely something that we need to work on um, and is something that we are continually trying to improve. Um, when they, when women are approached, oftentimes, again, there is an anxiety about being in the same space as a man and we do not have right now the facility or the capacity to have that look any differently but again it's something that we're um continually working on improving is there any discussion about a similar or satellite facility in a woman's facility in town yes there's always conversations <laughs> uh again something else we should work on uh, yeah. Tim, uh, Tony Kerrigan asks, uh, could you just quickly outline the various harm reduction programs that are available in Hamilton? Yeah, so uh, I mean, so the, yeah, for patients who have active substance use disorders, they should all know about uh, a couple of things, a couple of resources. The, the first is the van. It's probably the one that's the most active at this point in time. So the van um, has a phone number that patients can text or call and they will bring harm reduction supplies to the, to the patient. So uh, everybody should be provided with that number on discharge. Um, other resources in town would be the supervised consumption space at the uh, urban core, uh, which also provides obviously a, a safe space to consume as well as harm reduction supplies. Um, the AIDS network in on, um, downtown Hamilton uh, has a harm reduction room that currently is closed and has been closed since the start of COVID, but is reopening in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, so that would be another key place for people to know about as well. No questions more, but I'm going to ask one just to invoke chair's prerogative. So. You no, know, COVID has changed a lot of stuff, some for the worse, some for the better. Um, it, has COVID overall made things easier or harder? And, I, and that's a very broad question because it strikes me that, for example, you now have access to hotels that you wouldn't have had without COVID. But on the other hand, it sounds like having people in hotels hasn't necessarily solved some of the problems that we thought that it might. So your high level thoughts on this? Um, my, my thoughts would be it's made it harder for sure. I mean, I think the one thing that's been positive out of COVID is that uh, uh, in my experience, it, it brought a lot of the people that are involved in this sector together to work on things and, and, and brought them together in a way that I don't think has happened before. Um, again, everybody is so panicked about COVID at the start that people were willing to like put away their, their organizational kind of silos and, and jump into things to work together. Um, and the city definitely jumped in, in in terms of providing all that extra space. Uh, but for the patients themselves, again, this has been a huge, a huge, huge problem in mostly in the lack of services. So uh, all of the common spaces that people would access, um, you know, people would spend time in the library during the day. You know, I'm thinking about the fact that people are, are out of the shelter space during the day. Where are they supposed to go to go to the washroom to access food? All of those things shut down, as well as a lot of the social service agencies like the AIDS network that people would just drop into and spend time and have contact points with the um, with with service providers. So it's been a huge, huge issue, not just COVID related, but for everything else, um, particularly around the opioid crisis. Again, that's an ongoing issue in our city that has 
not gone away, it's gotten worse. And all of the attention and resources have gone to COVID again, understandably so. Um, whereas for our patients, the, a lot of times the priority is still the fact that people are dying weekly uh, on the streets for, of opiate overdose. And that seems to have kind of got pushed to the side now. Okay, thanks very much. There are a couple more questions, but it is almost exactly nine o'clock, so we probably should end. I'd like to just thank our two speakers today for a really interesting and I think eye-opening set of rounds. It's great to hear some successes and, and some failures and people who are dedicated and spending an awful lot of time doing something that I'm sure they're not paid as well as some other people are paid for in town. Um, uh, with respect to COVID, uh, we anticipate a big bump in vaccine availability over the next couple of weeks, so um, there may be the opportunity for people who want to work vaccine shifts. Uh, you can uh, get in touch with me if you want to get me to forward your your information to, to the people who are organizing the program. Uh, in a month, we have uh, Dr. Paulo Byrne giving us an overview of asthma treatment, a return to our traditional scientific presentations. I've heard Dr. Byrne talk before, and it's great. I'd like to thank uh, Tim and Kaylee for a really excellent set of rounds today, uh, really eye-opening, and I think helping us to better understand how we can care for this group of patients who are at really high risk of adverse events. Uh, many of which uh, we can't even begin to understand given our comfortable uh, lifestyle. So thanks very much guys and uh, best of luck with the program. And Tim and you and I will talk about a website. Thanks very much.